Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff I've Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. And today we have a very special treat, I will say, a bonus episode, because as you've heard us discuss, we do have a book coming out um, on August 29th. You can pre-order it now at stuffyoushouldreadbooks.com. But we also have an audiobook that you can pre-order at the same place. Uh, that is really, really cool. And it was in some ways um, kind of challenging because we had never done something like this before. Samantha and I, we worked with a very talented, amazing team. Um, yes. But Samantha and I <laughs> were new, new. And they were very kind and um, just a lovely group of people to work with and had so many great ideas. And one of them revolved around the, a lot of the chapters start with a graphic novel portion. And we, as a team, had to figure out how we were going to translate that into into an audio format, into this audiobook. And the result was just a really beautifully soundscaped section that's narrated by Eunice Wong, who did an amazing job. And it, it was just so cool to hear. It was so like, oh, look at this. They brought it to life. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was very uh, nerve-wracking, yeah. but... Uh, overwhelming and good moment to hear it come together. I think we've talked about how anxious we've been the entire time and then like freaking out about what, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? And then seeing the finished product or almost finished product. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, has made us really proud and seeing the way that that the people who we've worked with and who've helped us through this process really back us and support mm -hmm. us in this. It's been amazing. But yeah, so it's been um, an interesting, long, but honestly rewarding um, process to see how it's turned out. Yeah, it really, really has. And it's it was such a, a beautiful collaboration between so many people to make this happen. Who are and all we mainly wanted... women. Like that, yeah. like first I need to shout that out. I was very, I think we told them from the jump, like we want to work with as many women as possible or those who identify uh, or non-binary people because that's, that's what our show's about and we want to hold to that. And then as we meet more and more of the staff, whether it's on the publisher side or the audio publishing side, they've all been women. We're like, wow, this is, yeah. this is amazing. Thank you. It, it really <laughs> was. Honestly, so much support we've received too from them. So very, we're very happy to share this with you. So this is going to be a chapter uh, that Samantha largely worked on, but in every chapter we kind of both oh, have yeah. a little bit uh, at it's play. our trademark way of like yeah, it's it obviously one person, but mm -hmm. the other adds their personality to it every time and mm -hmm. adds so much support. I will say, I feel like this was the beginning of us planning this book. This chapter yes. was the first, like, oh, how about we do it this way? Because mm -hmm. we want it to be a little different and we want to change it up a little bit, and not just be a history book necessarily. Mm -hmm. what does this look like? And also, how does this fit our personality? Because we're not just always straightforward this and this. We have a mm -hmm. lot of our opinions coming out. And though this is a book, we wanted to do it in a way that was a little more abstract, a little more creative. Mm -hmm. I think this chapter was kind of the beginning catalyst of like, let's do it this way. And us falling in love with the idea of our book. It really was. And it's a fascinating history. So... It's all about the pantsuit revolution. And then I want to go ahead and put this uh, disclaimer right here. Again, we've talked about the fact that we wrote this in 2020. Things mm -hmm. were changing very quickly. We did mm -hmm. it in less than six months. Mm -hmm. And we really did not have a lot of time to correct and change things as it went along, even though we were like, we want to add so much more. And as we do when it comes to current affairs, when we talk about our own episodes, <laughs> We couldn't add like, oh, no, things are constantly changing and there's already an update because by the time we finally finalized this chapter and then we started talking about the audiobook, literally <laughs> Missouri lawmakers and Congress himself made this ridiculous law for making it stricter for women and the mm -hmm. dress code in the assembly in which this chapter 
talks a lot about uh, for women yeah. in Congress and how it really held women back from being a part of Congress. And we were like, damn it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I need to add this in there. And I couldn't. But yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. So many times that happened. <laughs> um, and that is just the process of writing a book that deals with a lot of current affairs that impacts a lot of people. So, yes, we are aware, um, <laughs> but still still very uh, important and worth talking about. Uh, so uh, we hope that you enjoy this sample chapter from the audiobook. Stefan never told you the feminist past, present and future. Chapter 2. The Pantsuit Revolution This is supposed to be the year of the women in the Senate. Let's see how they do. I hope a lot of them lose. George H.W. Bush, upon being asked when his party might nominate a woman for president. Sminty warning. Brief mention of rape and sexual assault. Fat shaming. Ableism. December 17th, 1969, Washington, D.C. Here, this is from all of us. This is from me? Oh, my. I think I need to show these pants off at the next house meeting. You have got to. A week later. You guys have to come see this. Representative Reed is wearing the pantsuit we got her. What? She looks so stunning. Also wearing my pants today. I was told there was a lady here in trousers, so I had to come over and see for myself. That is a very nice suit. You should definitely wear it more often. I hear it's very in now. Yes, Representative Reed, you've got beautiful taste. Wonderful. It was a last minute idea that I just thought was fun, but I didn't wear pants again. I didn't want to take away the femininity of the women in the house, even though I do think pants are feminine looking. On Danielle's first day, she is nervous when she walks in, but she is ready to go. It's hard to believe that she's made it this far. Congresswoman Carol Mosley Braun is the first black woman senator in the country and Danielle has been along for the ride since the early days of her campaign. Over the weekend, Danielle and some other staffers have helped situate the senator in her new office, so Danielle has already been able to introduce herself to many of her new colleagues. Apparently, they work weekends. Soon enough, she'll discover that they seem to never leave work. But that was the weekend, and it was all pretty low-key. Today is the first day of sessions, so the energy in the office is high. Danielle quietly trails Senator Mosley Braun down the hall as she shakes hands and greets her colleagues. But at the door to the Senate chamber, they are stopped by the doorkeeper, an older gentleman who has been working there for years now. I'm sorry, ma'am, but you can't come in. Mosley Braun responds, confused but polite. Excuse me? I'm a senator and need to be here for the session. I understand, ma'am, but you and your staff aren't in the appropriate attire to be on the floor and will need to change. Senator Mosley Braun stopped in her tracks with a shocked look on her face. The staff murmured concerned questions at one another as the hallway filled with other senators and aides piling up behind them. Many of those trying to squeeze by were men in similar attire, none of whom seemed to be concerned with what was happening. When Mosley Braun asked again what the problem was, the doorkeeper informed her that women were not permitted to wear pants on the floor, that she and her staff were the problem. The senator, confused and annoyed and a bit embarrassed, moved to the side with her staff to discuss how to proceed. After a quick, hushed discussion, Senator Mosley Braun decided to stay— She told Danielle and the others that she hadn't brought any other outfit, and there was no precedent for this rule. It was mere tradition, and weren't traditions just dated suggestions? 
After an awkward pause, the doorkeeper begrudgingly allowed her in. The judging glances from her male counterparts made it clear that this discussion was far from over. She ignored them and went about her work, but she already knew the male senators would be whispering about her attire in the days and weeks to come. After the session closed, Mosley Braun returned to her office. All her staffers wanted to know what had happened. Did anyone say anything? What do we do? How do we move forward? What should we say? One of Danielle's colleagues jumped in, reminding them that this issue had been discussed in the past. Didn't they all remember Representative Charlotte Reed? This wasn't the first time a woman had worn pants on the floor of Congress, and if the House could modernize, why not the Senate? In fact, wasn't this a good thing? This was Mosley Braun's chance to move this conversation forward, or, better yet, finish it for good. The staffers all agreed that it was long past time to change some archaic ideas that had existed for far too long. Wardrobe requirements, the most onerous of which were aimed strictly at women, seemed designed to further control and undermine the women who had worked so hard to make it to a leadership position in government. And that didn't seem right. The conversation went on. The recent Clarence, Thomas, and Anita Hill hearing had inflamed tension between men and women in government positions, with many women asking aloud how long it might take and what other rules they might need to bend before they could feel comfortable in these bastions of male power. The senator allowed everyone their turn to speak, then asked Danielle to look deeper into the question. Were these antiquated rules truly written down somewhere? As the first black woman elected to the Senate in the United States, Mosley Braun was no stranger to controversy or being made to feel uncomfortable in rooms filled with white men. But all the senator wanted to do was get down to business. Danielle stayed late that night and the next, doing her work and drafting a memo to share with the senator. She thought it was long past time to cause a stir, to make some trouble. She had no idea whether the senator would go along, but she took a deep breath and turned in her memo. The next morning, the senator called the staffers together. Senator Mosley Braun went over the implications of causing such a stir over an outfit— was it even worth pushing forward with it, or should she just let it go? Did it even matter? But in the end, they all agreed. It was time to shake things up. Let's cause some trouble. For the next session, they all agreed to wear pantsuits, staff and senators alike, to show a united front. The senator reached out to a couple of her colleagues, other female senators who agreed to go along with the plan, because they too had been thinking of pushing the issue. Danielle and the other staffers were thrilled. It felt like they had all stayed silent for far too long. It was time for real change. When the day arrived, all the women in pantsuits, young and old, massed outside Senator Mosley Braun's office, all smiles and laughter. They could sense that this was a big moment, that they were about to make a difference, not just for women in the Senate, but for women in realms of male power everywhere. They all began the walk together, some of them holding hands or linking elbows, headed to the chamber, talking excitedly. But once they arrived, they were met with a shocking sight. Not only was the doorkeeper standing in front of the chamber's door, arms crossed in front of him, he was accompanied by about twelve male senators. They stood shoulder to shoulder, arms folded, faces serious. One was holding a petition— signed by what looked like every man in the Senate, that put the hated rule down in black and white for the first time. Women will not wear pants in the Senate chamber. The men turned, walked into the chamber, and closed the heavy doors firmly behind them. Rules are rules, said the doorkeeper, shrugging, and he took up his position in front of the closed doors. The women stood silently, waiting in disbelief for their moment to argue their case. But it never came. But that's not what happened. That day in the Senate in 1993, 
those women walked right through the door in what would soon be known as the pantsuit revolution. The long-standing tradition, no women in pants, had never been a formal rule, and these brave women finally decided to change that tradition. Despite the lack of a written rule in the Congressional Dress Code forbidding women from wearing pants, it had long been enforced as an unspoken rule. And it wasn't until Senator Mosley Braun, who at the time didn't know about this silly unspoken rule, Senator Barbara Mikulski and Senator Nancy Kasbaum decided together to speak out that the issue was brought to everyone's attention. Women had long been denied access to congressional sessions due to their outfits, and not just when someone dared to wear pants. At one point in time, in fact, the rules of Congress were so stringent that there were provisions about how freely a woman's outfit could be. If the doorkeepers felt that a woman's choice of clothing was not in line with their modesty standards, bare arms, for example, or even if they just didn't like the dress, skirt, shoes, or jewelry a woman was wearing, they could bar that woman from entry. That happened so often, in fact, that a lot of the staffers carried multiple outfits just to appease these all-powerful doorkeepers. Although the House had already started to allow women to wear a pantsuit instead of a dress or skirt back in the 80s, the Senate, which did not have many women within its ranks, did not acquiesce to this newfangled idea of women being allowed to dress for comfort and convenience. While men were permitted to dress more casually on weekends, khakis and a blazer, the women's staff were still expected to wear skirts and dresses. But things were changing in Congress little by little. The previous year, 1992, had been deemed the year of the woman, after the November elections had brought several more women into the Senate, where previously there had only been two women. It was a year that many spent holding their breath, hoping that more and more women would start showing up, become more vocal leaders, and blossom into powerhouses within the feminist movement. Although many, like former President Bush Sr., as he made clear in the quote at the beginning of the chapter, mocked the idea of women being in leadership positions, the year of the woman did in fact make a difference. This wasn't the first time that pants had become such a controversial topic within politics. Several women within the suffragette movement tried using pants as the metaphor of sorts as they fought for women's voting rights. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Amelia Bloomer, and Elizabeth Smith Miller, three prominent women in the movement, are credited with being the first to wear a new style of trousers. In 1851, Miller apparently arrived for a visit with her cousin, Cady Stanton, wearing a daring new outfit. It was described as Turkish trousers to the ankle with a skirt reaching some four inches below the knee. Miller explained that she had had enough of tripping over her long skirt, so she decided to do the unthinkable and lose the shackles of the heavy, stifling skirt women usually wore at that time. Bloomer and Stanton were thrilled with the idea and immediately started planning to make their own versions of what they had already nicknamed freedom dresses. Bloomer was so excited that she published an editorial to praise this new clothing item in April 1851. Soon enough, requests from women around the nation started flooding in, begging for the pattern of these new outfits. In the wake of her editorial, the new garment got a new name. Women all over the country were wearing bloomers. Of course, it didn't take long before the critics, most of whom were horrified, began to attack and mock this new fashion. The term bloomerism was used both to indicate, with some disdain, that women were suddenly wearing trousers for the first time in public, and to imply that any woman who did so was corrupt and deviant. Bloomer wearers were, according to the disapproving men, women who smoked, gambled, drank, and eventually would abandon their families to live this wayward life. This traditionally male clothing item being usurped by women also seemed to imply all the ways in which women were trying to usurp the rights of man, for example, the right to vote. In the face of withering criticism, these brave women were booed at, yelled at, and accused of trying to destroy the traditional family and harm the reputations of their own husbands and families. Eventually, the abuse got so bad that even Miller and Stanton, in the hopes of salvaging their momentum towards suffrage, abandoned the bloomers, sometimes referred to as the short dress. Stanton told a friend, Had I counted the cost of the short dress, I would never have put it on. 
They had come to believe that the attempt to change fashion norms for women may have harmed their cause more than it helped once it had become too big a distraction from the real issues they were trying to address. Most of the women in the movement reverted to a more feminine style of attire in the hopes of attracting less attention rather than more. They were rebranding themselves as respectable so that they would be taken more seriously and pushed through the bigger change they were seeking. It would take well over a century and many more brave women pushing for change to get us to that weekend in 1993 when those brazen female senators and their staffs walked into the Senate chamber wearing pants refusing to be kept out of the seats of power. In the aftermath of that moment, we have seen the ever-rising power of the pantsuit. It is the de facto power broker uniform and is worn by powerful women everywhere, from leaders like Hillary Clinton, Nancy Pelosi, and Vice President Kamala Harris to fashion icons and celebrities like the Kardashian sisters, Beyonce, and Julia Roberts. There are so many expectations around women's fashion choices that still need to be changed, from uneven enforcement of dress codes in schools to rampant victim-blaming for women's clothing choices. Though, what did she think was going to happen wearing a skirt like that? But the pantsuit rebellion brought widespread awareness to the uneven standards placed on women not only in Congress, but beyond. And though being allowed to wear pantsuits in Congress may seem trivial to some, the bigger issue at hand is what remained unsaid during the controversy. The rules about pants were being used as a way of silencing women and diminishing the seriousness and legitimacy of women in power. By criticizing and policing the way a woman is permitted to dress, those in charge undermined the work these women were doing. History is filled with the subtle and not-so-subtle ways men have banned women from positions of authority or attempted to marginalize their presence in the room once they've finally been allowed in. The patriarchy has made clear that it will take whatever opportunity it can to quash the accrual of female power in whatever way it can. And yes, there is progress, but as always, it is slow and often halting. In 2020, we had the largest number of women in history elected to Congress. But even so, there are 17 states in the U.S. that have never elected a woman as a representative in government. We have had many firsts, though, including the first Native woman to be appointed as Cabinet Secretary, Secretary Deb Holland of the Department of the Interior, the first openly gay person elected to the Senate, Senator Tammy Baldwin from Wisconsin, and of course, the first woman and woman of color to be vice president, Vice President Kamala Harris, among many others. And I'm proud and grateful and all the things, I swear it. But sometimes I pause and think, it's 2023, y'all. Weren't we supposed to be jetting around and flying cars by now? And yet, we still haven't had a female president in this country. There are so many important roles that have yet to be filled by women. We'll just have to wait a little bit longer. Nevertheless, damn it, we will persist. Journal entry. Did you know that in 2017, the women of the House decided to rebel against some of the other dress codes they felt were unfair, such as the rule against wearing open-toed shoes or a sleeveless top? They put out word that it would be hashtag Sleeveless Friday, and at least 25 women showed up in sleeveless attire to protest the old school rules. The then Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, agreed to take a look at the dress code, but made sure he avoided any blame for the situation. He said, This is nothing new, and certainly not something that I devised. At the same time, that doesn't mean that the enforcement couldn't stand to be a bit modernized. Of course, he also added that people should be in appropriate attire. But as we know, throughout history, it seems that only men get to dictate what is deemed appropriate, and that continues to be true today, whether in school, workplace, or even on the damn plane. Remember that bizarre leggings on a plane scandal of 2017? On social media and in real life, there is constant scrutiny of the idea of what is appropriate, and almost all the judgment is aimed at women. We just keep having to justify our bodies, our lifestyles, and our existence. 
The patriarchy keeps getting to decide social boundaries and social norms. Who can wear a dress? How short? What color? Requests for modesty abound. Women shouldn't dress in ways that might distract a man and lead him to behave badly, right? We have been told that women flaunting their bodies can be blamed for the downfall of men. Women's clothing has been blamed for anything from bad grades and bad behavior in school to assault and rape. Why, when a woman gets assaulted, is one of the first questions, what was she wearing? For as many steps forward as we have made as a society, there have been just as many setbacks. When we talk about dress codes, we may not always recognize the misogyny that motivates these codes. Perhaps it seems like a small thing, but as we look at the people who are most affected by the dress codes, we start to see patterns. Whether it's a way of requiring a specific gender to follow more stringent rules, which often makes it more difficult for them to advance in their career or field, see doorkeepers in Congress, or a way of labeling certain students as troublemakers due to what they wear, students can be labeled or targeted for their fashion choice. Goth or hip-hop styles, for example, are considered less acceptable to some. Sometimes the powers that be just use someone's clothes or hairstyles typically black hairstyles, perhaps, or clothing styles popularized by hip-hop, as an excuse to hold someone back or prevent them from getting the protection or the justice they deserve. Both good news and bad news have come from this age of social media and 24-hour online access. The good news is that we are exposed to more looks, styles, and diverse content than ever before. We see boys putting on makeup on YouTube, amassing huge followings. We see gender nonconforming individuals lauded for their fashion sense and all kinds of folks breaking new boundaries when it comes to clothing, hair, and makeup. But there's bad news, too. There are still gatekeepers, and nowadays there seem to be so many more of them trying to keep us women in line. Online trolls, commenters, and fans have no problem fat-shaming celebrities, influencers, and regular people alike. The unrealistic expectations of looking perfect at all times has skyrocketed. Though many are fighting the good fight, attempting to promote more realistic and relatable content, including the body positive movement, there's no escaping the constant expectations for us to look a certain perfect way, an expectation that has been shaped by the male gaze and male rules and regulations for centuries. No matter how many influencers and experts tell us that it's more important to be healthy and happy, the vast majority of what we see and share tells us otherwise. Beyond that is an even less understood yet far more widespread blindness to the prevalence of ableist narratives, which not only exclude so many, but oftentimes just outright denigrate or ignore those in the disabled community. Let's not even start talking about what is available in the world of fashion for those in that community. And this type of inaccessibility happens in the plus-size community as well. The clothing and fashion industry ignores, abuses, or takes advantage of those who are outside societal expectations. I mean, when Beyonce first started out, designers were refusing to dress her because she didn't conform to standard industry sizing. Now, of course, they are clamoring to do so. But if you need to actually be Beyonce in order to live outside society's accepted body expectations, how can we, the normies, even hope to try? Recently, we have started to see celebrities and influencers speaking out about how fat phobia and body dysmorphia have become dangerous within our culture. People have become vocal in the fight to shut down the unfortunate kinds of practices that exclude those from the plus-size communities, such as labeling anyone who doesn't fit a specific standard of beauty in a derogatory manner. As a result of this increasing awareness, there seems to be more acceptance of the idea that past standards of female beauty are not realistic and oftentimes harmful for so many women. But still, the gatekeepers of the fashion industry continue to perpetuate the overall sexist agenda by controlling what people wear and how they can wear it. How do we break this down? How do we try to delete years of misogynistic and ableist mindsets so we can start over? How can we stop gendering clothes and stop policing what we think someone is or is not allowed to wear?
How do we build a world in which we all ignore centuries of control and the attendant judgment and encourage everyone to feel good, beautiful, comfortable, or maybe just a little bit human for a while? Fictional Woman Side Note In 1993, the hit sci-fi show The X-Files debuted, featuring Gillian Anderson as FBI officer Dana Scully. Scully not only played against type for women, the skeptic to Fox Mulder's believer, but became a queer icon. I, for one, remember being in middle school very confused as to why I was attracted to both Mulder and Scully. She also became a fashion icon with her pantsuits, shoulder pads and patterned slacks, so-called competence core. Some argued that this displayed Scully's need to wear masculine-style clothes to fit into a male-dominated field. As the series went on, though, her clothing choices leaned more traditionally feminine. She would go on to inspire the Scully effect, the name for the perceived impact this character had in terms of girls and women pursuing careers in STEM. Also, fanfiction alert! The X-Files had one of the first large online fanfiction communities, to the extent that, at one point, Scotland Yard decided to investigate it, worrying it might lead to a Heaven's Gate-type situation. Women and Fashion Throughout history, women's fashion has rarely had to do with comfort or practicality. Instead, it has often been about, one, hiding feminine bodies and teaching shame, Two, showcasing feminine features for the male gaze. Three, marketing to sell women more stuff. For instance, women started wearing bras and shaving because of popular fashion trends, primarily when thin silks came into style in the 1920s. Don't even get me started on the uproar the short bob hairstyle caused in the United States during this decade. Not only that, but history is riddled with examples of women's fashion that were outright dangerous. Makeup and fabrics made with arsenic, deadly nightshade eye drops, harmful skin lightening treatments, hoop skirts that got caught in the wind or lit on fire. Oscar Wilde's two half-sisters died when their skirts caught on fire. This is not a joke. There were hobble skirts, Skirts so narrow, women couldn't take a full stride, which were designed to literally slow women down. There were unwieldy weighted sports uniforms. At one point, women wore weighted bathing suits. Weighted bathing suits! Okay, they were lightly weighted, so the heavy skirts wouldn't float. But still, it sounds like a murder weapon, doesn't it? These fashion woes still hound us to this day. Within the past few years, a discussion of why clothes marketed to girls and women tend not to have real pockets went viral. God knows I always want more pockets. And as we saw in the previous chapter, women athletes are still fighting for less sexualized uniforms. Women are still judged more harshly for what they wear, what their tattoos look like, what hairstyles they choose. The list is endless. We've come a long way, but men still seem to think they're in charge of policing how we look. Fictional Women Presents The Avatar Name, Ellie Williams, from the Last of Us video game series. Bio, grew up in the Boston quarantine zone, lost her parents at a young age to the zombie apocalypse, bitten by a zombie at 14 while on an outing to the mall with her first crush, Riley, who was also bitten. Turns out Ellie is immune. Travels across dystopic United States with Joel, who becomes her surrogate father. She is smart, queer, competent, sarcastic, funny, loyal, and absolutely terrifying. Has a chance at happiness and chooses revenge. Open to forgiveness. Relevant quote, I'm just a girl, not a threat. The bigger picture. More women play video games than men. Let me repeat myself. More women play video games than men. And yet, the narrative around it would have you believe that only men play games, that women don't care about video games. Therefore, 
games are geared mainly toward men. And if women don't really play them anyway, the argument goes, what does it matter if the world of gaming is toxic? Who cares if the few women characters exist mostly for the male gaze and for the male playable character's conquest and storyline? A playable character, also known as a player character or PC, is a fictional character in gaming whose actions the real-life player controls. Why shouldn't the female character usually be skimply dressed or nude? Don't even get me started on the games that glorify rape. In over 75% of games with only one protagonist, that protagonist is male. Some male video game developers have even stated out loud that female characters are too hard to animate. Neutral face emoji. This analysis will, of course, have its detractors. Often, the statistics differ depending on what counts as a video game, which is a point of contention and, frankly, often pretty sexist. If you include phone games, which are seen as lesser slash less serious, women play more. Also, men are more likely to call themselves gamers, though women are playing just as much, according to findings from the Pew Research Center. In 2018, a report came out that made headlines that women had surpassed men in console gaming as well. Video games got caught up in the gendering of toys that occurred in the 80s and 90s, and they were, at the time, labeled for boys. Early video game sellers targeted boys because they wanted boys, rather than girls, as their consumers. The same can be said for action figures and board games, which historically have been highly gendered. The amount of gatekeeping around video games is downright upsetting. The Women's Media Center's Speech Project found that users with female usernames were 25 times more likely to be threatened or harassed compared to users with male or gender-neutral usernames. And female video game journalists are two-thirds more likely to be harassed. Perhaps the most famous example is that of Gamergate, when journalist Anita Sarkeesian received sexual assault and death threats for daring to discuss sexist tropes in games. Several of her talks have had to be canceled due to bomb threats. She was sent violent images of herself being murdered or raped by video game characters. Death threats. Tell me again about freedom of speech. Who is being silenced here? Women make video games too, despite outrageous obstacles in their way. However, the number of women in the gaming industry is pretty abysmal, and the attrition rate is high. Numerous women have spoken out about the truly misogynistic and toxic work environments that drove them away. As of this recording, one of the biggest gaming companies, Activision Blizzard, is under fire after the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing filed a lawsuit in 2021. The details have been truly horrific, painting a picture of a workplace that was disturbingly hostile to women and other marginalized employees. Stories of sexual assault, misogyny, racism, and homophobia abound. This behavior prevented women from attending work functions and from being promoted and often led them to leave the company, if not the industry, altogether. This has created a vicious cycle where our games are made under the status quo, with women characters as sex objects and women and girl players not prioritized. The potential for so many great games has been lost due to this lack of diversity in the field. It may not seem like it based on popular news coverage, but video games can have a positive impact on things like brain development, coordination, empathy, and conditions like PTSD. Of course, that is highly dependent on which game is being played. Gaming can be fun, rewarding, moving, and in some cases, almost life-changing. Video games are a big business, and they are not going away. And we're telling women and girls they don't belong, that they shouldn't be making them, Hell, they shouldn't even be playing them. And if they do, it's only as long as they obey the rules. Don't complain, stay in their sexualized lane, as though it's only by the grace of the male gatekeepers they are even allowed in the space. Then, the second we raise our hand to point out a problem with the status quo, we are threatened until we leave. But we're missing out on so much If we don't work to change the space to make it less toxic, then it's game over, gamer. Game over. Why She Matters to Me I've always loved video games. 
I think they can be beautiful spaces for storytelling when the player connects to the playable character in a way that is different from other media. I've played games that have absolutely devastated me, and I've played games that have moved me. To not have a female character in the space that I love or one that is not sexualized is equally devastating. Years ago, I actually stopped playing online games because of the harassment I received. I was 12 at the time. I had a gender-neutral avatar and name, but I guess it wasn't enough. It's strange that as a 12-year-old, I was receiving countless sexual overtures and threats, yet somehow I just thought, yeah, that goes with the territory. Eventually, though, I decided I couldn't hack it, so I had to leave. In my mind, the problem was with me. I kept playing, just not online. A part of me still felt I was weird, that I was somehow trespassing into a world where I was not welcome, and that I was either going to be forced out or hit on because of it. So I mostly kept my gaming a secret. I was good. Not as good as my brothers, I told myself. I couldn't possibly be, I thought. But I was good. Once in college, I won a Super Smash Brothers Melee tournament. I went to a technical school whose population was over 70% men. So as you can imagine, this was a big deal. Almost immediately, all the other competitors, all men, ganged up on me, started shouting at me, complaining that I cheated, that I was a lying bitch. I never competed again. Most of my favorite games involve complex or interesting female characters, usually playable. May I list some of my favorites? Was that a resounding yes? Terra and Celis from Final Fantasy 3 slash 6, Tifa and Aerith from Final Fantasy 7, Yuna, Riku, and Lulu from Final Fantasy X, Claire Redfield from Resident Evil, Elizabeth from Bioshock Infinite, Maya from Parasite Eve, Alex from Oxenfree, Fem Shep from Mass Effect, and of course, that brings us to one of my favorite game series of all time, The Last of Us. Marlene, Dina, Yara, Lev, Riley, Abby, and Ellie. I remember the first time I played The Last of Us, when I was introduced to the foul-mouthed, lethal, traumatized and funny 14-year-old Ellie, I felt the strangest sense of relief and bubbling happiness. This game is not happy, by any stretch of the imagination, but I was happy to play it and to play her. There were still plenty of tropes, including that of a young girl being the ultimate innocent to drive the violent actions of the main male character. Again, find me over drinks and I will discuss them at length, but I adored her. Then, spoiler alert, you might want to skip these next few paragraphs if you don't want to get hints about what happens in The Last of Us Part 2. The second one came out, and she wasn't the same girl. She'd grown up. She was more cynical. I loved her still, even though it hurt to see, to play, the vengeance-obsessed woman she'd become. But seeing her, playing her, you connect. You pour some of yourself into her. You beg her to make different choices. Even though you can't control the plot like you can to some extent in other games, you control the character and play your part in it, so it feels like a commentary on you. At least, that's what good games can do. And the commentary sought to make you question what you yourself have done and glorified as a gamer. The violence, the nameless deaths. It made you question gaming, what it is and what it could be, and your part in the whole thing. A lot of people, a lot of them dudes, hated it. It's fine not to like something or to be sad about how it played out, to have criticisms, but a lot of this backlash wasn't that. After the new version came out, countless death threats were made to the creators, to the voice actors. The male gamers didn't like these questions. They didn't like being asked to be empathetic, to think about gaming and what's wrong with it. They didn't appreciate playing a woman's violent revenge story, though they had never had any qualms about playing a man's. They felt entitled to a certain type of game. One that didn't put stories about women, queer folks, people of color at the center. But I loved it. I connected to the tale of loss, of choosing vengeance over happiness and the fallout, leading to the realization of Ellie's ultimate fear. 
being alone. As someone who recently lost someone close to me after our relationship became strained and damaged, who wanted to forgive but couldn't until they were gone, it hit hard. Made me cry like you wouldn't believe. Unless you're a friend of mine, then you would believe it. It's time we asked some more questions about gaming, about why we've allowed it to be so toxic for so long, and what we can do about it, because we have a lot of work to do. While we are seeing more games with diverse characters made by more diverse creators, the backlash is still horrifying. In part because of that, these numbers have actually decreased in recent years. We are going the wrong direction. Maybe if more women join me online and demand a better world when they get there, we can get things moving in the right direction once and for all. And that brings us to the end of this bonus episode. We hope that you enjoyed it and you enjoyed all of the narration, the sound effects, and also all of the hard work it came to making this come alive in audio form. Because even though we're in podcasting, I've realized trying to explain our podcast is difficult because we talk about everything and we also do it very, as this book shows you, like, hi, I have an interjection, which is sort of hard to translate in some <laughs> ways in an audio book format. Yes. But I think that I they did an amazing job. And I hope that you really enjoyed it. And I hope that you will check it out because uh, the published date is coming August 29th, 2023. And you can you can pre-order now at stuffyoushouldreadbooks.com, either the physical book or the audio book or both Ooh. that won't tell you what to do. <laughs> 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 we would really, really appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening. You can find us on Twitter at MomStuffPodcast or on Instagram and TikTok at Stuff I Never Told You. We do have a Tee Public store if you want some merch. And yes, you can pre-order the book, uh, audio book at stuffyoushouldreadbooks.com. Thanks, as always, to our super producer, Christina, our executive producer, Maya, and our contributor, Joey. They really were a huge part of this book that we don't talk Mm -hmm. enough about, especially the things that have been thrown (laughs) at them at the very last minute. We're sorry and thank you. (laughs) Yes, we're sorry and thank you. And thank you to the whole team, uh, the audiobook team, who you all were amazing. Thank you. Amazing. Yes. And thanks to you listeners for listening. Stuff on Ever Told You is a podcast from iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, you can check out the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 